Good evening, everyone. My name is Kara, and I'm the founder of Bad Girls Collective, alongside my partner here, Anna. Welcome to our book club, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening, for welcoming us into your homes, and your personal space, and most importantly, for joining us for this important discussion we have ahead of us this evening. If this is your first time with us, I will give you a quick little intro to our club. We were founded in 2017 as a collective. We meet monthly to discuss books and topics with authors that aim to dismantle what it means to be a good girl. Um, before we get started, I want to start by acknowledging that here in Canada, we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. In particular, we acknowledge the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. As a collective, we are committed to learning more about these nations, their cultures, and raising awareness, and advocating to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across this country. And thank you all so much for your generous donations. We will be making a donation directly to the Black Legal Action Center, our author's choice cause. This evening we raised over $3,000 so far, which is amazing, a month into the donation bonanza um, that was June, um, and I hope that you continue to do so. We have over 300 friends joining us this evening, and again, thank you so much for, for joining us. I also want to shout out to our event partner this evening, Cotton, our favorite Canadian clother. Uh, Cotton is a Toronto-based ethically made clothing brand with a focus on natural materials. They are a certified B Corp company with bricks and mortar stores in Toronto and Montreal. And they donate a portion of all their in-store sales and online to building schools for children of their cotton farmers. All of our Bad Girls clothing is also made by Cotton which you can take a peep at on our website, badgirlscollective.ca. So now for our discussion, we have some loose rules, nothing too uh, harsh, but we have all of your mics turned off um, while our host and author are having a conversation. Um, at the end of this discussion, we'll have an audience Q&A. At that time, you can raise your hand digitally if you want to ask a question. So to do this, you need to open up the chat that will be shown on the side of your interface. And to do so, you just click the chat icon at the bottom. And then once you have your chat opened, you will see a raise uh, your hand icon. Um, and at that point, you can ask a question and we will unmute you and then you can ask away. Um, if you're not comfortable speaking on camera or with your camera off, you can also just ask your question there in the chat and we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Now, enough from me. I shall introduce you to our author and host. Tonight we are here to discuss The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole, which was released in January. The book chronicles the year 2017 and takes an in-depth look into moments of systemic racism that occurred in Canada in that year. Desmond is the fearless Canadian journalist, activist, and broadcaster whose voice on anti-Black racism is known across the country and beyond. Our host, Nanaba Duncan, her bio reads very similar. She's a host and producer of the CBC um, show uh, Fresh Air, founder of Media Girlfriends, which is a podcast, scholarship, and network that supports advocacy of underrepresented perspectives in journalism. So I pass the mic over to Nanaba and Desmond to talk about his brilliant work, activism, and book. Great. Um, I just saw this message. Some people have messaged that it's reached a max. I'm going to let you deal with that. Um, yes, my name is Nanaba Duncan, and I am so happy to be here with you, Desmond. Um, how it is that I've been working at CBC for the last number of years and haven't talked to you yet is strange to me, but also I, I think I understand. Like, I feel like there are so many reasons why that is. But um, I want to start today. Talk about some of them. What's that? I said, I hope we can talk about some of them. 100%. That's going to come up. Um, so uh, I, my name is Nanaba Duncan, but I also say to people that 
in this time, my name is also a very tired black lady because I am tired and I've been tired a lot and I'm tired for so many different reasons. For some of the reasons that I think people have read about just being asked to do so many things, but also just like taking on the weight of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanna start with a little bit of joy, which is uh, the flowers that you often tweet. Um, and I know that your mother helped you. She's part of your appreciation for beauty. How did that come about? Um, so I really like lilacs and they say that they're very much like they trigger memories. I mean, all smell triggers memories, I guess, but I feel like there must be something particular about that flower. Um, it is for me though, anyway, because like, I'm pretty sure that since we were kids in Alberta, my mom used to cut lilacs and bring them into the house. And that was like a, a smell that I always associated with like my house and my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, in writing this book in the year 2017, um, well, I, sorry, so I was really doing most of the hard writing in 2018, and mm -hmm. it was really tough. And mm -hmm. I got four chapters into this book of writing about anti-Black racism and white supremacy as it manifests in schools, uh, as it manifests with our police. Some examples from my own personal life, uh, you know, journalism industry as a whole. And after like four chapters, I was like, this is really heavy. Like, who's reading this book? Like, <laughs> they need a break. I need a break. So I decided to write about in May, not uh, following the sequence of the book, another necessarily like news incident or event, big national public event in Canada that had happened that month, but just talking about how I was taking time out for myself that month, how I was going places with friends and taking walks at nights because it's spring and all the flowers are coming out. And this led me to talk about my mother and yeah, her cutting those lilacs and bringing them into our house and giving me that appreciation for nature and for beauty. Uh, for me, it's Jasmine. Jasmine at night, um, just, mm -hmm is so, so beautiful for me. Um, and being like, I wanna say accosted by a beautiful smell at nighttime is such a lovely experience. Um, do you remember the first time you were genuinely afraid of the police? Yeah. Um... And I can't say I really understood what was going on, but I saw it through my family. So I actually wrote about this in a 2015 piece called The Skin I'm In, which I wrote for Toronto Life Magazine, which was what ultimately got people interested in asking me to write a book. And um, in that piece, I talked about a time when I was like, I think I was like eight or nine, and I had relatives visiting from England and we were going to Niagara Falls because where do you take people when they come to Southern Ontario, right? You go to Niagara Falls every day, you pack some coolers and you go down there. You take too many pictures. And, and we did that. And um, on the way one time with my aunt and uncle and my cousin, uh, my cousin threw a Kleenex or a piece of garbage or something out of the car window while, while we were driving on the highway. And we were driving in front of a police officer who promptly pulled us over. And there was just an immediate level of change in the mood of the car and fear in my dad's whole posture and his voice. I had never actually seen him afraid like that before. What did and he do in his posture? Wow. It was almost like um, if you see somebody like, you know, imagine that the person's walking to our vehicle and you're almost like sitting upright like this yeah. and you're like, they're yeah. like stiff yeah. and you're like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you're bracing for something. Yeah. And I had never really seen my dad act like this uh, before. So I got scared then. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the car was quiet. And this officer came up and told my dad somebody had thrown something out of the car. My dad was terrified and was like, he's going to go pick it up and like motion to my cousin, like go because we hadn't driven real far. Like it happened like 
instantaneously, like this thing came out the window and the sirens went on. Almost as if he had been following us and, you know, meaning to pull us over or watching us anyway. And so that day I really realized all my relatives were afraid. My dad was afraid. No one was saying anything. And after we drove away from Did you ask about it in that moment? No, I didn't. But what I remember was that as we were driving away, it was still really, really quiet in the car for a long time. Nobody said anything. And then my dad turned to my cousin and my dad was like, you know, everyone in this car is black, right? Mm. That was it. And then we just kept driving and nobody talked for a really, really long time. Mm. Hence, and people were upset. Mm. Um. In the book, you say that uh, white supremacist improv is a game that anybody can play. So uh, can we play it? How do, how do I play this game? Well, people might think that sounds weird coming from you to me to Black people. But as I point out in my book, um, white supremacy has a role for everybody to play. Um, so when I say white supremacist improv, and I mention in the book that you don't have to be white to play this mm -hmm. game, what I'm talking about is that, of course, this um, colonial system, right, that we live under in Canada, this system that says that the queen is somehow the head of this country still, uh, and that, you know, Canada is really an offshoot of the British monarchy, all of our laws coming from another continent, and our norms and our legal system and our policing system all imported from white Europe, right? Um, the way that you play white supremacist improv in that kind of a climate, which discriminates against black people, discriminates against indigenous people, discriminates against other people of color and does so to control resources, right? White supremacy and racism is not about being a jerk to somebody. It's about controlling things for the benefit and comfort of white people at the expense of everybody else. So let's take, um, Nana, you're driving to work one day and you get pulled over, okay? <laughs> so now you're gonna tell me about how you were doing the speed limit and everything was fine. And I'm gonna say to you, well, how do you know that, you know, you didn't roll through that stop sign back there? I wasn't there, right? I can't tell you what your experience as a black woman is, but we do these things to undermine people's ability to call out white supremacy. It's called white supremacist improv, and we see it all the time. People hear of a situation of racism. They weren't there. They don't experience racism themselves, but they feel this need to, like, make up what they wish had happened in the situation. So I might start telling you, that it's probably because you didn't renew your license on time, or maybe the officer thought that you were a criminal and mistook your car now and ever for somebody else. And see, you might not be thinking about these things, but the police have a hard job now and and you just have to understand what they're going through. That's white supremacist. It's not very fun, but we could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example because, uh, but I actually realized I have a lot in my life and you can play the game on yourself okay let's talk about that now let's talk about that well i think we would call that internalized racism right so i think that um when black people like barack obama the former president of the united states is campaigning to be the first black person ever to be the president of that country and, you know, he gives these speeches at black churches where he says, you know what's wrong with our people? We need to pull up our pants. We need to start talking right, right? We need to get uh, graduated from school. That's what's wrong. And all of those things could, you know, in some strange, weird universe be true. But he's saying that to a white audience, right? He's saying that knowing that the way for him to succeed as a black person is not to play into these racist stereotypes of why black people don't succeed. So I agree. Even with you. if he knows that he's playing it. Yeah, well, even I, if I mean, you know he's playing it, sometimes you have to play it, or sometimes people people feel they have to play it in order to get the thing. And they're right, and and they're right. So 
I've been a journalist for 10 years in this country now, and I've done well in terms of the proliferation, the spread of my work. That 2015 Toronto Life piece that I wrote was an internationally read piece. Mm -hmm. I did a documentary of the same title of this book mm -hmm. in 2017, and it was one of the most viewed docs on the CBC network that year. Um, I think it was number two, actually. Um, this book has become the best-selling book in Canada. But I not only don't have a job in Canadian media, Nanaba, I've never had a full-time job or been offered a full-time job in the Canadian media landscape because I insist on talking about things like white supremacy and not interpersonal instances of racism, you know, the dude shouting racist epithets at somebody walking down the street. That's not, that's not what concerns me. What concerns me is why this country is still so good at putting black people in jail, giving black people the lowest income jobs in Canada, why this country is so good at the police killing black people, even though there's only about 3% of black people in the country of Canada, and yet so many of us are in jail, so many of us have been murdered by the police, so many of us have been taken, children taken by the child welfare system. That's the new one. Um, this colonial country, again, on stolen indigenous territory, they created an intentional system called residential school and said, let's separate indigenous peoples from their children. Let's separate the adults from the children because that way, when we destroy their families, it will be easier for us to occupy this land that's now called Canada because they're stronger when they're a unit. So let's tear them apart. Let's teach the kids our religion, our languages, make them forget their religion, their languages. That's residential schools. That's the 60s scoop in Canada. But today in Toronto, 40% of the new child welfare cases in this country are of black, or of, in the city in Toronto, I should say, are of black children. So a system that was designed to separate indigenous children and parents and weaken those families is now doing it very efficiently to black people as well. That's white supremacy, that's colonialism, that's what we're fighting against. We're not fighting and, against and this is, shouting racial epithets on the street, right? Right, and this is what makes you different from some of the other journalists who uh, have full-time jobs in the system, or as, as you're saying, because someone like me, if I even start to broach where you are in the way that I speak in a room, then somebody's going to call me an activist. And I'm always, and I, I'm, I, I've, been, I've been actually pretty open about this lately, you know, uh, talking to people and saying that we have young black journalists coming into media who are speaking about white supremacy uh, openly and well, and they're being screened for activism. And so my question is like, wh why does talking about blackness make you an activist? I think that it's because when your country holds whiteness as the norm, like Canada does, then when Canada pretends that whiteness is the standard for everything, then of course, like if somebody gets to express their opinions from a non-white point of view, they're seen as like adding something to the discussion that wasn't there. Whiteness is all around us, of course, but white people don't talk about it, right? So it's this um, fantasy that there's something called objectivity in journalism. No, talk about it. Right? And so objectivity means mm -hmm. that you don't bring your own personal views or experiences into your work. You're some kind of machine. And that's it's supposed to be like good. And you know And yet, uh, we have when we talk about if I'm if if we're gonna talk about uh, sexism and gender roles, if or sexual assault, rather. Um, I had this very discussion this week, or in the past week, Desmond. I spoke to someone and just talked about how when we, when we talk to a woman who says that she was sexually assaulted, we are in a place now where we say, 
okay. And if we're journalists and we want to know more about the story, we ask more about the story. But if it's a story about race or someone is talking about a racist event, uh, what happened? How long ago did that happen? All these extra questions and the bar that has to be held seems higher. And I would add to that that um, that means that, for example, a woman like Dion Renee, who I talk about in the September chapter of the book, um, a woman who herself was physically and sexually assaulted in Toronto Police Headquarters in the lobby in the middle of the day before a police services board meeting. You know, like these are the kinds of things that happen to Black women that are a convergence of racism and gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the media and their so-called objectivity, this was an incident that happened where Dion, as I chronicle in the book, was doing what a lot of us have been doing for years, going to police services board meetings in Toronto and demanding justice and demanding a change in policing when it wasn't as popular to do that as it is right now. Right. And Dion has a disability, so she needs to use the elevator at the police headquarters. By the way, we need to have a separate conversation, you know, in our about own accessibility? mind. accessibility? Not just about accessibility, but about why a meeting to hold the police accountable happens in the police headquarters. Why do you have to go to police headquarters to have a meeting about police accountability? It doesn't make any sense, but it's a, it's a way to intimidate people who really want to speak out against policing from not wanting to come into that big imposing place with thousands of cops. But anyway, Dion was denied access to the elevator. And when she asked for a supervisor, the man behind the counter, Jamie Party, denied that. And then he came around the, the counter and attacked her. The media comes to police services board meetings and the media were there that day. And many members, of the media saw and some recorded the immediate aftermath of this police officer assaulting Dion while she was sitting stunned on the ground after he had thrown her to the ground. And for two weeks, as I reported in my book, Nanaba, no media company, CP24, 680 News, many CTV and Bell are Bell owned properties, right? They just, they just held on to the footage like it didn't matter. And then when Dion two weeks later courageously came out and said, I was assaulted at police headquarters, suddenly the media started releasing all of this video. They didn't see this assault on a black woman in a public place like that as being a crime. It didn't matter to them that the special investigations unit ended up actually opening an investigation into all of the police because they're not supposed to put their hands on a, a woman inside of their police station like that. The media just, said that for the sake of objectivity, meaning not believing this black woman, this isn't even a story. But when she came out on her own and said that this happened to me, suddenly the media was there with their footage saying that she was angry, saying that she was shouting in the place. She just got assaulted. Of course she was shouting. But, you know, since this is the bad girls uh, collective, you know, I think that black women are often for doing nothing but existing put into this category of being dangerous and not credible. And so this is the so-called objectivity that we practice in our media, an objectivity that watches a black woman get assaulted and has video and doesn't do anything with it because they're like, she says that, but we don't believe her. Uh, speaking of not believing black women, there's a, another point in the book where uh, you're talking about a woman, Brenda, whose child was handcuffed, her six-year-old child was handcuffed. And um, Ryan Doyle uh, talked about this on his show. Ryan Doyle is a host on News Talk 1010. And he talks about how, uh, how, how Brenda speaks of race being a factor in how her child, Simone, was apprehended. Right. And he says, he takes issue, he says, you just lose all credibility when you start to talk about the race card when we're talking about a little girl who's obviously got some emotional issues that she's dealing with. 
And I bring him up because I was listening to Ryan Doyle on News Talk 1010 a couple weeks ago. He was on with a, a, a media girlfriend, Rashmi Nair, and they were uh, talking about the DeFonte Miller, the Michael Tiro uh, case, and DeFonte Miller. And Ryan Doyle sounded different from the Ryan Doyle here. Ryan Doyle was challenging anyone to come on the show and try to say um, pretty much anything against DeFonte Miller, actually. Um, he sounded like he, if you didn't know him, and I don't, he sounded like a person who may understand systemic racism and what happened in that case with a teenager being unjustly beaten. Um, and you know him, you've been on his show, and you talk to him. Do you see a change in understanding in people like Ryan Doyle around you? Okay, well, there's a lot to this. So mm -hmm. when Ryan heard, and we all heard, you know, what was it now? Um, three years ago, that story of this girl that I call Simone in the book, who had been shackled in her Mississauga classroom, right? The cops came in because they heard that a little girl was throwing a tantrum. They actually called the police on a six-year-old grade one child in Mississauga. And when the cops came, these two thugs took their handcuffs and they shackled this girl. They used the handcuffs to chain up her wrists and her ankles. They actually put the handcuffs on her ankles first so that she couldn't use her legs. Um, when we all heard that story, you know, I remember listening to my radio station news talk that day. I worked at news talk on Sundays for five years, right? And um, what was happening that day in Nava was white supremacist improv. It was all white men, this roster of white men on the radio, hour after yeah. hour, just making up stories about how you can justify that you had to chain up this six-year-old, 48-pound, black girl and that that didn't have nothing to do with race and that anybody who said it was about race doesn't understand that there were probably some very logical reasons to do this to this child they couldn't name any of them but that's white supremacist improv too is is that refusing to see again what's mm -hmm. right in front of you the racism and trying to make up an excuse for it because you feel protected by that racism or you feel threatened by black people calling it out and ryan so, doyle was talking like that he was. And then three years later, you know, now he's outraged that a court didn't convict the Terrio brothers who attacked DeFonte Miller, another story in the book. Um, do I think people like him are changing? No, I don't. I think that you have to be quite perfect of a victim in this country still as a Black person in order to garner any sort of feeling of sympathy and justice. Um, from the general white Canadian public. And I think that for a lot more people, for some reason, uh, DeFonte Miller um, was a more sympathetic figure. And I think I've actually figured out a little part of it, though, Nanaba, about why that is, about why people felt so much sympathy for DeFonte, but when it came to the six-year-old girl, they were like, well, what was her mother doing? Where was her mom? I think there's two things, actually. One is that, again, we're dealing with a black woman and her black daughter in one case versus a white man or a black man in DeFonte. And number two, DeFonte lost his eye. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that there, this is kind of gross, but this is the world that we live in and the world that I try to talk about honestly. There's like some kind of sick notion of wages for being able to know, for example, but that's what they did to DeFonte to get to look at all of those gruesome, disgusting pictures of DeFonte's eye everywhere the, for the rest of that young man's life. No matter how long he lives, if you search his name, the first thing you're going to see is a picture of him at his most beaten and vulnerable. And I think that that kind of imagery um, 
is the kind of price that white people want to believe us, quite frankly. Show us, show us how bad it is. We don't believe you, we, don't, we weren't there. Now they want body cameras so that they can watch more of us die. They don't wanna stop the death from happening. They're like, we'll catch it on camera. And then maybe we can see how bad it is what happened to you. That's what the white settler state does in order to protect itself. It says, you really gotta show us something black people if you want us to believe you. And I think that losing an eye is um, a pretty horrific thing and it made even people who don't usually pay attention make uh, have them have a little bit more sympathy but i i kind of just think that like it's very a sad sign in our country that you have to actually be that badly disfigured or murdered as a black person before people will have any concern for you so let's talk about the web that supports the police um you've mentioned schools uh, child welfare, um, what else is there? Child welfare, schools, and prisons. Prison. <laughs> yeah. Can you, I mean, we could be here all day, but I'm really interested in how they work together. So Which one, one comes the, first? Oh my gosh. Um, so I think actually like, Okay, there's a few things that I can say, right? One is that um, this book and the work that I do owes a huge debt of gratitude to other people who have done this work before me, including a lot of other black, amazing writers and scholars in Canada. So one of them is Robin Maynard, whose book, Policing Black Lives in 2017, um, made it possible for me to write the book that I wrote, right? And I cite Robin in my book. And one of the reasons that I love Robin is that She's always trying to remind us how these systems all fit and work together, right? So um, the last chapter of the book about Abdul and Fatuma Abdi, that is a chapter that shows you about how all these systems work together. Two young people who are refugees from Somalia lose their mother while they're in a refugee camp. Their aunts take over as their guardians. Canadian officials meet them in a refugee camp in Djibouti and say, would you like to become Canadian citizens? They say, yeah, we would. Through a three-year process, they do all the immigration stuff and they come to Canada. But I talked about child welfare, right? Almost immediately, almost immediately after the family arrives here for reasons that Abdul's aunt still doesn't understand, child services comes and takes these two children away from her and puts them in foster care in Nova Scotia, in group homes and in the child welfare system generally. And they get bounced around from house to house, from group home to group home as little new immigrant children who barely speak English. These two children were punished for even speaking to each other in Somali, which again, I'm going to go back to the residential school system. If that sounds think, familiar. Right, if people in Canada today think that like, oh, you know, Way back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whenever, how far back that you want to go, people did some really mean things to Black and Indigenous mm -hmm. people. But when it happens today, it's just by accident, or it's just like an accident of the system, you know, the remnants of it. Imagine child welfare workers in Nova Scotia telling two Somali immigrant kids who were taken away from the only family that they know that they're gonna be on timeout in the corner if they speak Somali to one another because these white people in Nova Scotia just don't wanna hear these two kids and are actually maybe scared that these two children are somehow plotting against them by speaking a different language. Um, that's the immigration system meets the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Abdul Abdi grows up after running away multiple times from foster care and being abused in foster care he does what about half of people in foster care do. He gets in trouble yeah. with the criminal justice system, right? Yeah. Now that's a new system coming into play in these young folks' lives. And then there's going to be police involved in that to, to make sure that we can catch you and take you to jail for all of your things and monitor you after the fact. All of these systems are conspiring. I can't say which came first, but what I can say is that, again, this is all about resources it's always about resources and so when you can take black children away you can literally give a job to a white social worker 
managing the files of black and indigenous children who are to be taken away from their families. And you can spend tons of money on that system, but you won't give any money to the black and indigenous families who you're saying that we have to separate. It's a huge mythology, by the way, that children are taken away from their parents mostly because the parents are beating or starving the children. Uh, in Manitoba, for example, 87% of the child welfare cases in Manitoba are because of poverty. The government takes Indigenous children away from their mm -hmm. families in Manitoba, saying that the parents are too poor to support the children. But they have a hundreds of millions of dollars industry called the child welfare system, where all this money gets spent to manage the files of Indigenous people who they say are too poor to parent their kids. It's Can about I tell you a story? Resources. Absolutely. When I was younger, I lived in Thornhill. I have two sisters. We went to Brownies a lot. Um, and we would go regularly. And one day, um, my mother was late to pick us up. I don't know how late she was, but they called child services, welfare services on my mother. And I never went to Brownies again. And I will always remember the abrupt end that just suddenly I didn't go. I never learned about what really happened until much mm. later. This is in Thornhill. And so what you're saying is ringing true for me because I also know the numbers about uh, welfare and how child welfare and, and how it affects, um, oh, Bumi. Bumi's also saying the same thing. Child services called on her mom. Um, and how late was my mother? What? But, but like, what if, why isn't the concern, like, maybe something happened to your mother, right? That we need yes. to make sure that she's okay. Why is yes. the concern to get the police involved? Yeah. And, 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 you know, just to, like, thank you very much for sharing that story, because that's a, like, that's a tough, tough story. And oh, I have, of no, these, I have more. It's fine. I, I, we all sure. do, right? Yeah. We all do. And that's the thing. I honor, though, that fact that it's, it's not always easy to share this stuff. But I want to say, too. Everything that we fight against in terms of colonial and racist and um, classist systems, the defense of not changing them is always that white people's safety and comfort will be compromised if we change something. So we can't abolish the police because white people will be unsafe. It doesn't matter how many black or indigenous people the police kill or put in jail or assault or make go missing. We have to have them because if we don't have them, then white people won't be safe. We have to keep taking children, right, away from their family members because if we stop doing that, then we're going to have this chaotic situation that's going to spill over into white communities and hurt them. This is why things cannot change. It's not because people don't understand it. It's not because people don't have the data. It's not because people don't have black and indigenous people telling them the truth in this country every single day. It's just because white majority populations, whether we're talking about here, whether we're talking about Europe, they understand that this racial hierarchy is helping them. They understand that all of our children getting suspended and like expelled from school, again, the exact same thing. We can't, I, I, do you know how many times at community meetings I have been told that we can't get rid of suspensions and expulsions in school. Robin Maynard, once again, she talks about the school to prison to, or sorry, she talks about the child welfare to prison mm -hmm. pipeline, right? So like kids are getting kicked out of school or being apprehended at school and ending up in the jail system. White folks will tell you that their kids won't be able to concentrate and have a good education if these rowdy black children are allowed to be in the school. It's literally always about like, if we let you live normally and don't punish you for everything, we're going to be under threat. That is what white supremacy tells white folks. And when people talk about like decolonizing our minds, 
right? Decolonizing our ways of thinking. That's what people are talking about. We're talking about what James Baldwin said when he said to white Americans, like, why do you need this figure of, of the Negro? Like, why do you need this person in your mind? People said the same thing about the Jews during the Holocaust, like that if the Jews had not existed, Hitler would have invented them because the Nazis needed an enemy. They needed somebody to scapegoat so they could take all the resources, take all of the land, take everything for themselves and say, well, we deserve mm -hmm. it. White supremacy does that. And the same white supremacy that caused the Holocaust is the same white supremacy that's still pointing guns at indigenous people in Wet'suwet'en. It's the same white supremacist system that says we can't get rid of the police in Canada because somebody's gonna be at risk. It's the same thing. And so decolonizing means learning to confront that fear of yes. the other that says if we don't hurt and punish you and we don't create yes. this system full of harmful punishing consequences that somebody else is going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And decolonizing the mind is uh, something that just like the white supremacist uh, improv game, it's, a, it's something we can all do. Yeah. I grew up in Newmarket. <laughs> I learned to talk like the people around me. There's a reason why my voice works on air versus someone, versus if it was me and I had an accent, right? right. And so um, I'm, I'm, con I'm conscious of the time. Um, I know we're gonna get to questions really soon, but I wanna talk about the N-word. So, um, you have in your book, uh, this bit about Nancy LG. She's the York Region District School Board trustee, and she re resigned after she calls the black woman, a black woman, an N-word. Yes. Recently, Wendy Mesley, in an editorial discussion, also used the N-word. In both cases, they say they were repeating someone else. I find that so common. And I'm curious as to why you think that happens. Why don't people just say, yeah, I said it. Why is it that you are repeating someone else? And also, I mean, my question is, why does it come so quickly out of your mouth? You think we don't know why? Anyway, go on. <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, in the book, I talk about Nancy Algie calling a woman named Charlene Grant the N-word at a public meeting, no less, right? In front of other people who can hear what she's saying and then lying about it and saying that, oh, well, you know, I was just repeating what I heard somewhere else. I didn't actually say those words like of my own mind, you know? And Wendy Mesley recently, CBC host, exact same thing. She says it in an editorial meeting with her team and then puts out a public statement being like, I was repeating a black person. I wasn't saying that like out of my own mind. There's a lot going on there. I think one of the obvious things that's going on there is like, you know, when, you know, when you're a teenager and everybody's singing along to Jay-Z in the car and then your white friends actually say the word that they're not supposed to say. And then they're like, oh, no, no, man. I was just singing along with the song. Yeah. And the rest of us are right? like, oh. This happens to me. Uh, That's what happens like, to me too. And I'm, I can feel it. And I'm like, you know? oh. But, but people actually think that there's, um, it, it, it's like they take the most loaded word in the English language. And then they say, well, I was saying it in the nice way. That's essentially all this is. It's like, Do you think they know a, it's loaded? Do you think some people don't think it's loaded? No, that's stupid. No, I don't, I I don't think. Asking. I'm not saying you're stupid for asking. No, no I know. I don't know. But, but like, no, I, I don't buy anybody who says, I really thought I was using it like this. How can you be a tens of, like, a, a, like a, um, Wendy Mesley's been on the, on, on, in the media for like 40 years in Canada. How could Wendy Mesley be a professional with all of this experience and then tell us that she thought when she was using that word, she was using it in an educational and like enlightening way. She's lying. And the problem that we have in this country, among other things, is that it's white supremacist improv again. If we don't know what Wendy really said, then white people can say, oh, well, maybe she was using it again in some kind of reasonable way. Maybe there's a reasonable explanation. Not just you should never say that word if you're white, period, full stop, no discussion, no explanation, no nothing. No, no, what if there's a reason? Come on, black people. 
And, you know, some of us now use this term called gaslighting, right? Um, I don't remember the play, but there's a famous play where there's a husband and a wife on stage and the husband is cheap, I think, and wants to save fuel on the gas burning uh, lamp. So every time his wife turns his back, her back on him, he turns the lamp tiny bit down and she says, is it getting darker in here? Is it getting darker in here? And he's like, baby, I, baby, I don't know what you're talking about. That's gaslighting, right? And it's white supremacist improv. It's making a reality to obscure the one that exists and to make the person who's experiencing it feel like they're crazy, essentially. Um, what is unfathomable, Sanaba, to people like Wendy Mesley and Nancy LG is that they could just get off the stage. That they could just say, yeah, as you were mentioned, I said that. I know it's unacceptable. I don't have to fight for myself. There doesn't have to be some huge public debate about whether I said it or what context. It was wrong and I'm gonna step away. That's actually all you need to do. That's real accountability is holding yourself, right? Accountable for your own actions mm -hmm. and for the choices that you as a grown ass person are making. That's accountability, not me having to force it on you, not black people having to have a debate with Wendy, not people having to call her out as we've all had to because she refuses to just own up to what she did. Um, accountability actually means knowing it yourself and taking responsibility for yourself. And, and that's the thing is that until we get there, all of the scolding, all of the guilty white liberal crap is not gonna get us anywhere. People actually have to, um, and, and, and you know, it's one thing when it's just like a white person saying something in an editorial meeting, but when that white person can be on the air for 40 years and black people can't get past internship because any little thing that we say or do is gonna be used against us, that's the real problem. It's not a word. It's a culture that rewards some people for being huge ass racist, but doesn't let us progress and do the brilliant things that we need to do. It is 7.51. I think uh, we should take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> because you so and I can go on. Though. I'm having What's so that? much fun. I'm oh, having so good. much fun. Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad. Um, we should probably let some people in on this. Um, Agreed. Do, 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 do. How do I get the questions? Help me get my questions. I'm, I have to figure <laughs> out. Uh, so, if I, for everyone who, first of all, I want to apologize, Nanaba and Desmond, we had a bit of a misstep where we didn't have the right plan selected. So when we hit 100 people, a bunch of people weren't able to get in. So we upgraded ah! the plan. And we figured that out around 7.25. And I oh, sent no. an email to all the attendees. So we, everyone was informed of the upgrade and they should have been able to get back in. Um, so okay, hi everybody. There. Hi, 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 hi. Hello, hello, hi, hello. So I will give the instruction. If you want to raise your hand, open up the chat function. And then there's a button there that you can raise your hand digitally. Um, I have yes, so many questions if they don't raise their hands. <laughs> the good news is that we're recording all of this, right? So hopefully... Uh, That's the thing. Not, yes, yeah. we will be sending out a recording of the whole conversation to everyone tomorrow morning. Um, Hi, everybody in the future. Hi. <laughs> uh, is anyone able to raise their hand? Or if you can't, physically okay. raise your hand or comment in the comments. If you want to ask a question, then we'll, I'll unmute you. Oh, there we go. God. Hadir. Hi everyone, this is Hadir. Um, so I just had a question about, so like you said that your writing process, Desmond, started in 2017 and everything. I haven't read the book yet, unfortunately, but with everything that's going on these days, like what do you see the future being like? Like immediate future within the next year and then futures in like five, 10 years from now? Do you think with the protests, with everything that's going on in the States, you know, with the elections coming up, like, how is this going to change? And with COVID as well, we can't deny how COVID has disproportionately mm. impacted mm. people of color, Black people, women. Um, how do you see all of this affecting the Black community? Hey, dear, thank you. That's a really wonderful question. Um, there's so much I could say. Certainly, um, with COVID, um, I guess white supremacist improv is just like the theme this evening, Nanaba, because you brought that into it and I just can't stop thinking about it now. 
But like when COVID started to hit, because the United States actually documents things, then we refuse to do that in Canada, which is a, like, a, that's one really big difference. Like people want to say Canada is so different from the United States. Yeah, we are different. You know how we're different? They actually track their racism and we don't. Like yeah. that's one way that we're very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. They are ahead of us in that regard. Um, now they know that black people have been severely, severely affected by coronavirus in large part based on things like access to healthcare, poverty, inability to physical distance, black people having to go to minimum wage jobs in factories and places like that and being forced to continue working because they just can't afford to stop working, all them kind of things, right? Um, we don't have any data here in Canada and our governments showed all of their collective asses at the same time, Adir, when they were like, oh, we don't want to collect those statistics because we just want to treat everybody the same. I actually had- We don't dude. see color. We don't see color, exactly. <laughs> we, so how can we help you if we don't even see who the heck you are, right? <laughs> so I actually had a conversation with a man on Twitter who was saying, oh, I'm exaggerating about being worried about that in Canada because he said, most of the people who are going to die are elderly white people in nursing homes. My elderly black mother works at a nursing home and lots of elderly black women work in nursing homes. Who do people think is taking care of these people? And let's really bring it home with, again, how these systems work together. Because one of the chapters in my book is about immigration and I focus heavily on Haitian black people coming here from the United States and coming into mostly Montreal and the surrounding area. Now those Haitian people came here leaving Trump's America because when Donald Trump got into office, one of the things that he did was cancel protected status for Haitians. A lot of them had to leave Haiti after earthquake outbreak, earthquakes in Haiti, cholera outbreak in Haiti, right? A lot of really dangerous situations. And they came into Canada and our government was like, how do we get rid of these people? That was the first priority. It was not to keep them. It was not to protect them. It was like, how do we get rid of them? Do you know where hundreds of Haitians here, are working today? They're working in long-term care homes in Montreal and the surrounding area, taking care of COVID patients and bringing COVID home to their families. And a place called Montreal North is one of the hotspots of COVID-19. And it's where all the Haitian immigrant people with no status are living and they go to work taking care of people in this country when they have no status, no access to health care. This is our country. I don't want to talk about ICE. I don't want to talk about the United States of America. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And I Desmond, will add, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, want to yeah, remind yeah. that I just want to remind you that Hadir's question was about the future too. Yes. I, you go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I appreciate that. Um, you know, but that's, that's, that's what's happening now. And I need us to see that reality so that we can think about what the future is going to be like. This is what our government is doing with the unprecedented protests, with the unprecedented conversations about blackness that are still being had. They're still like, we don't want these black immigrants here, but if we can use them to pay on the cheap, to make some money off of them, then, then we're cool. I don't think that's going to change because some people have demonstrated in the streets in, you know, June of 2020. We're in for a long, long struggle. There's no moment or no incident. You know, I think we think of the civil rights movement when it's taught to us now as if like this is this, like moment when Dr. King gave a speech and then everything changed. Far from it. Um, this is a lifelong decolonizing our own minds and spirits process that we're in. But just to- Do you see it happening? Do you see the decolonization actually happening? And then we'll go to the next question. It's Real a push quick, and yes pull. or no? It's yes or no? It's a push and pull. No, it's okay. a push and pull. Like it's not, it's not happening I'm, before I'm, our I'm eyes. Playing. We're, not, we're not seeing the change happen right before our eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean? What I actually think is going to happen in the future more than anything is the symbolic stuff that we've been seeing. It's Justin Trudeau taking a knee. It's Toronto City Council being like, wow, now we're really concerned about policing, but we're actually going to increase the police budget. We're going to get a lot of lip service in the next couple of yeah. years. And those of us who want to fight are going to have to get by the lip service and really focus on 
items of action change right. like that we can see and touch rather than lip service? It's okay. a great question, Hadir. Thank you so much for answering. So we have Eva's question. Should I go to her or, oh, we have Alessia. Alessia, go ahead. Hi, Desmond. I just want to say I have so much praise for your book. It helped me get through an entire semester of writing a thesis uh, with the help of it. And it actually opened my eyes a lot to the racism that occurs in Canada that I was very ignorant to. And like you mentioned, we're very quick to point the eye to, to point the finger to the United States when we have the exact same issues occurring within our country. Um, and kind of just running off the last topic that you mentioned about uh, being like not really seeing that decolonization happening what kind of advice do you have for especially I would say like people of color who are trying their hardest to like defend and support black lives um, especially after you've said like you've been defending them your whole life and have and and have never been offered like a full uh time job or or or, or sorry a contract because i think that's like a really big fear for me is i've been working so hard and it's a, like a really big passion of mine and that's actually like what i want to do in the future is defend human rights but i think there's also a big part of me that is really fearful of like how much behind the scenes actually happens for somebody of color to actually be able to have their voice heard within those systems um so yeah i don't know if that made any sense but yes, it does <laughs> um i can't call it advice but i can i can speak to my own experience and what my own experience tells me is that number one it's called capitalism and we all need to have a job or it's really hard to live so uh, we don't have to get caught up with the individual is the first thing I'll say. Like what I personally do for a living or what one individual personally does to survive in this capitalist hellhole is not their choice most of the time. Like very few of us are lucky enough to actually get to choose our career, choose our hours, choose when we wanna have children, if we have them, if we want to. Like, what our future is going to look like when we retire. So we have to grind and struggle in this system. And sometimes it offers us like really difficult systems to work in, like systems that are doing a lot of harm in our community. So what I would say is that outside of what we do in a day job, we have to find ways to fight for the radical dismantling and altering of those systems. And what that means for me is like, I'm a journalist, right? So I take money from all of these bad, evil corporations that I like to talk about, right? Bell Media, Rogers, I've been paid by all of them and their affiliates through my own journalism. I work for a publishing company now that has published uh, authors who I know are totally racist and are sharing completely racist ideas. So it's not a purity test, I think in short, right? But what I'm trying to do is I'm like, I'm going to do journalism the way I believe in it. And I'm going to encourage other people like yourself. Anything that you want to do in this world, we have a responsibility to do it in a way that pushes change, pushes equity pushes a new way of like looking at the world. So when Nanaba talks about um, not being seen as objective in our industry, we push back against that as black journalists. Yeah, does it make us popular with everybody? No. Could it mean that you lose out on opportunities that other people might get if they kept their mouth closed? Yeah. But if I want things to be different 50 years from now, I can't always be like, well, I'm gonna keep my head down I am not gonna cause trouble. I am just gonna, because then what happens is we pretend that occupying space in journalism or in government or in a corporation, just being the black or brown person who's there is like the change. It is not the change. If we can't speak our minds, if we can't push for things wherever we happen to be, then if our ancestors took risks for us all to get here, every single one of us. We have to take risks for the next generation. It's like the best way that I can. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
We're going to move on to uh, Eva Salinas, who is also happens to be a meter girlfriend of mine. And Eva, I will let you talk uh, in just a second. I just want to say that this idea of, you know, speaking when you, or, or doing this work because our ancestors did it, I think we have to. I also think that we can take our time in doing it or we can do it when we're able. Yes. Sometimes I think we're so, sometimes I think, man, I'm soft compared to what other people have had to do. I am so soft. What have I done? I sent a tweet today. What did I do? <laughs> right? Um, but there, it, it's, still, it's still true that, I mean, I, I guess I'm just saying I agree with you. They did something. So we, we have to do something, something, something small. Eva, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you. Am I, am I, uh, I don't know if I'm, my video's there, but anyway. We can hear um, you. I mean, we can see you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you both so, so much. Um, yeah, so, so valuable. And I just feel uh, great to, to listen to this conversation. Um, as I mentioned just before, I realized how to put up my hand and, and now I have. Um, and you touched on it just a little bit in the last uh, response, but I'm just wondering, you know, this is a big question, but I'm just wondering, you know, seeing how traditional media responded even three years ago or four years ago when you made that choice to go independent from the star and how traditional media saw, you know, the activist journalists. Do you see, and this is kind of a question for both of you, but do you see, you know, the pathways, which ones maybe are opening up more eagerly, you know, those who are listening at the top, or, you know, in terms of, do you have faith for any change at traditional media? Does it have to be the people that need to change. We know all these things. I, I'm trying to cover what maybe some people might also not know in this conversation, but uh, you know, the many different ways that those pathways will happen, you know, new generation of journalists, traditional media changing, or maybe we just also need to kind of go away from the traditional media and do new independent. So I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. I feel as though the last part of what you were saying really gets at what I believe, like traditional media has to die. It's probably mm -hmm. going to anyway, because corporate media doesn't want to fund it. Uh, by the way, quick little like, I think really important analysis of why media is failing all over this continent right now. It's because advertising dollars are the same as they were. Maybe people are spending more on advertising now. I don't know. but those advertising dollars, instead of going to the Toronto Star or to Bell Media or to Rogers, are going to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Mm. That's it. That's the old, it's not because there's like these idiots who are mismanaging the media. It's not none of those like narratives. The reason our media is failing is because the advertisers went online. They can get advertising to more people online for cheaper and they can track it. They have all these digital tracking ways to know who's clicking, how much they're reading. It's way cheaper and they get way more out of their advertising buck. So traditional media is dead. It's mm. never coming back. But what's not going away are corporations that control all of the resources in this country and they will find other ways to get their messages out. So I don't actually see a world in 20 years where we're going to be doing like real social justice because in order to be doing that kind of media, for example, um, let me just give a really quick example. An oil company invests heavily in some media outlet, right? Is the media outlet going to write stories about how the oil company is polluting the oceans, killing indigenous peoples to get to their land? No, no. Capitalism is still going to capitalism. And so media is going to change. There's going to be a lot more independent media. There's going to be a lot more misinformation as well as media changes, I think. Um, but our fight is not to create an equitable media landscape to me. It's just to destroy capitalism because capitalism is the thing that makes the media unfair. It's not that it hasn't been occupied by the right people yet or have the right business structure. That's my opinion. I'm curious what Yanaba wants to say. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say about capitalism. <laughs> I don't have words about capitalism, but um, 
Eva, are you talking about like where where this is? How can we solve this media problem? Is that what you want me to solve right now? Um, no, that's too big of a question. I know. I mean, I even just saw the ten recommendations for CBC, and I thought to myself, you know, yes, you know, you know, obviously, you know, obviously, obviously, you know, day one if to see what happens next if they're going to enact them and, yeah. and yeah. practice, you know. But um, I know it's a big. Well, let question. me give some let background. Uh, I'll give some background to that. So uh, I, I work at CBC, um, but I'm also, uh, I also used to be the chair of uh, Diversify, which was, um, which is an employee resource group at CBC for employees of color. Um, when, uh, like last month, um, when I guess a lot of things were going around in terms of what's happening in media and, and how we are reporting when it comes to race and blackness and anti-black racism in every institution, including media, then uh, a number of us were called to have a meeting with the senior executive team. And after that meeting, um, uh, 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 the people that were called to be part of the meeting, a number of us met and we um, uh, talked and we kind of argued and we came together with these 10 calls to action. And I tweeted about it today just to report and just for an extra added level of accountability so that everyone knows what is happening at CBC. And um, I have to tell you, I was shaking. I was scared. And the reason I was scared, even though I'm on staff, even though I'm very well supported at CBC, even though I have a, a great fellowship coming ahead of me, I was scared of what was going to happen to me. I, I kind of still am. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. But um, why am I telling you this? Um, okay, so that's the background. I don't know whether anything's going to happen. I just know that we had to say something. I know that we had to come together and stop with the stories of what's happening to us at work. I've told you enough times that people want to touch my hair. I've told you enough times that I've been told that I'm, that, that I'm only there because I'm black and I'm female. You don't need to hear those stories anymore. Where I'm coming from is, okay, let's change it. Let's, let's stop talking, let's, let's just change it. And so, even though I remain hopeful, I just know it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of people who are maybe better than me at, at, at like synthesizing everybody's intake or have a, a thicker skin to take it all, I don't know. Um, but I will say that if media dies, as it is, as Desmond is saying, that there will be plenty of people who will be well equipped to take up the independent route. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. We're at 812. I'm like, are you okay, Desmond? Do you want to answer some more questions? Okay. Yeah, how are you feeling? Okay, let's go to Denise. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, Denise. Okay, hi. I just wanted to say, Desmond, um, your book was such a gift um, to read. So many things I didn't know about, but also um, about my own experience in Canada, but also about um, the Indigenous experience. So I really appreciated that you included that. Um, you. So I actually just wanted to ask, um, why did you choose to include, um, what, what did you think was important about including chapter, the chapter about uh, joy I guess that was the May chapter. And what was your thinking around um, including that in this book and its importance about black joy? And I guess kind of rest was part of it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know your thoughts about that. Um, I really wanted to write a work. Thank you for the question is a really good question. I really wanted to write a work of journalism and journalism is very it's a profession that takes itself extremely seriously mm -hmm. and so i think part of writing that chapter was not wanting to just always fall into that not wanting to mm -hmm. think that like, in order to be a real so-called journalist that i had to always just talk about facts and numbers and what we know and what we don't know and actually saying that 
because we were talking about objectivity before and this false notion that you can like take your emotions out of storytelling. Right. Um, I didn't want to do that. I wanted my emotions and my reactions to doing this work to be visible to people. And that's part of mm -hmm. a bigger philosophy that I've kind of, um, that I've developed over the years of, of um, doing this work. You know, if, if we all hear a story in the news tomorrow that a child has been hit by a car. Um, we know when we hear a story like that, that the journalist's voice changes. Mm -hmm. we know sometimes when things like this happen, like when children are victimized in our community, people in the media can even express anger. And we understand completely, why wouldn't you be angry, for example, of like a hit and run involving a child? Nobody says to the journalists in that case, no, no, show no emotion, be objective. No, you're not doing your job if you don't express the justified outrage of a child being victimized by something in society. And in right. the same way, I think that as a Black person talking about our experiences in this country, I'm not being a good journalist to my audience if I pretend that this is some kind of thing about mm -hmm. like numbers and ledgers and like discrete facts that don't have any... I'm not helping you understand your reality if I pretend that that's what the news is. No right. one is objective. That's the thing about objectivity. We're mm -hmm. all bringing our emotions and our experiences and our feelings into the work. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to be more honest about that as writers. So I was trying very hard to model that by including that chapter about, you know, how I take steps back from this work, how much I enjoy my friends and the care mm -hmm. that they provide me in support and just like life things just life yeah. things, things that I like to do to relax watching birds mm -hmm. and everything <laughs> nature you know just like yeah. the normal things that's actually part of our lives as well and it should be on the page yeah. okay great thank you so much thank you we have a question from Gordon Gordon Conrad go ahead Conrad yeah Is he there? Oh, you're on mute, Gordon. Okay, there you go. Oh, there we go. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess I charged me down my phone. Um, I guess the the white people improv thing was, um, I, I guess that's how you, you describe that, and that's how I would describe, um, I guess, traditional media, like or I think of like CNN and Fox News, and and I think of like the, I would jot down here, the uh, Laura Ingram. Um, Fox News. She was, I guess, a year ago. She, uh, LeBron James, made a comment about politics, and and she said, "Shut up and dribble." You know, your job is to use your platform. Your job is to shut up and dribble. And you're, you're talking with the best athlete in the world, and the the mo the, the you know he's the he's the best coach in the NBA because he's you know the, and he uses his voice for for the right reasons, and and he's allowed to use to do that. And then Drew Brees says, you can't take a knee during the national anthem. I picture my grandfather being killed. And it's like, and she's like, well, he's allowed to have his opinion. You know, he's a professional athlete. He can use his voice. And then they, so it was com compared and contrasted of like, shut up and dribble. And then, you know, you're allowed to use your voice. And I guess I have this massive distrust with, um, I guess I saw something else that was kind of trying to tie this all together with them. Um, with burnout of being overwhelmed by things. And um, I think I kind of shy away from consuming media because I know that well, it's like the, the, the thing I kind of tell some of my friends is that um, uh, Vox News did a video a while ago as in VOX, not Fox, um, mm -hmm. on YouTube about how uh, late night comedy does a better job at covering Trump than CNN and Fox do because they see, they like will say, oh, you know, well, Trump, he said he didn't mean it, so he didn't mean it. Like, he didn't mean, he didn't mean, mean grab them by the, you know, he was, he apologized after, so it's fine. And late night's like, this is, this is stupid. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, this is ridiculous. And I guess I have this massive distrust with, you know, the media because it is, to me, completely just, um, like, white improv of, mm -hmm. like, justifying, ridiculous justifications of words being only held for their, like literal value not there's no yeah, there's no, no context and it's completely bullshit and it's tiring and it's like hearing people just go in circles of like this is ridiculous it's kind of more commentary but i guess other than 
and now I'm going to, you know, pay attention to what you write, but what are some resources for consuming media and consuming the world that, that you would recommend that aren't, I guess that are in the most imp, uh, impartial way. Um, if that's I, I think, I, I think the greatest media tool that's been created in my adult life is Twitter. Okay. It's not even. It's not even close. I just tweeted at you. I just tweeted. <laughs> that, that, and and, and the and the reason I say Twitter is because Twitter is for amateurs. Twitter is uh, every journalist I know is on Twitter. Yeah. But, and I follow a ton of journalists, but I also follow a lot of really smart people who no one would ever listen to if they didn't have that platform. People who are doing incredible work in their communities people who think really sharp, but again, maybe they're at work doing IT all day, but their contribution to like the social discourse that we're talking about is that they like, you know, they analyze things online and they put them out there for people to think about or to question. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing I think, um, Gordon, is that um, what Fox News, CNN, and every big media corporation in the whole world, what they all also really do well is they distract us, right? Because in the end, LeBron James's opinion about whether or not we need to, um, you know, address police brutality, really not that consequential. Like, I'm not telling LeBron James to shut up and dribble, but I don't care about Drew Brees either. Who the fuck cares about these guys? Excuse my language. Like, like, yeah, exactly. like reducing, reducing our struggles as like millions of people down to whether or not one or another celebrity got it right that day and mm -hmm. that can dominate a whole day's news right but but doesn't that, that also happen on twitter like that can cause a problem on twitter too it it and and i that's a really really great point but Sorry, i think that that, no no <laughs> it's such a good point but yes that can happen on twitter as well but based on who you follow right yeah you're picking and you're curating who you're listening to. So hopefully over time you learn what people are always reacting to the latest mainstream media sensation and which ones are tweeting about community gardening every day of the year. You figure that out pretty quickly and you can filter out the people who are always reacting and, um, you know, bigging up the days. What did Trump do today? Like I think basically the news for the last three and a half years in America is what did Trump do today? And I would actually bet anybody, if you went and audited a show like The National on CBC, that they've probably had more lead stories about Donald Trump than anyone else in the, in the country that we live in over the last three and a half years. So we are doing this as well. And it's a really great distraction from media using its resources for way more important things. But that is the culture of media as entertainment that we live in. And that's why I do love Twitter because I can find people who are constantly cutting through all that. And if I follow people who are doing that all the time, it's just a quick gold unfollow and keep it moving. Yeah. Like, I, do you have something beyond Twitter for Gordon? Oh, I mean, the thing oh. is, I always, I'm realizing this because I keep getting this question about resources. It depends what you want to know, right? Blackness is not a narrow subject. Like, I'm covering such a narrow slice of Canadian politics for black people in my book. If you want to read political stuff, I mean, there are so many books on lists out there that um, you can find from Robin Maynard to Black Lives Matter Toronto's book, Until We Are Free, to um, the writing of L. Jones in Halifax, one of the most prolific black people writing we have in this country who gets very little attention. Um, but then, you know, if you want to write, if you want to read about culture, if you want to read about sports, there's all kinds of other resources that, out there. That, it's really about your, your own personal interest. There's a, someone said something in the chat that kind of, I think, is an interesting add to this. And I guess I was going to say, I haven't read your book. Where's the best place to buy it to support you? I'm sure different. Anywhere. Places. I get Anywhere. that question all the time, too. It, it's, it's, cool. it's all, every and any audiobook, ebook, and hardcover. They're cool. all wonderful. I'll pick up a copy. Thank you. We have uh, no more questions. Would you um, like to and, um, maybe, shall, shall we end up the discussion by talking to each other for a couple oh, more minutes? Okay, sure. For six minutes, <laughs> I can do that. Um, 
let me make you the only one I see, because I like that. Um, so there was an, another, I mean, so today, this is what I would say if you just came to my house. I'd probably say, did you read Kathleen newman Bermanks article? No. Okay. So it was about um, what about systemic racism in, in media and all these stories about what she has gone through from being told that she wasn't sassy enough on the air as a BJ and that she seemed too smart and that she needs to be sassy um, to like getting passed over and then getting asked and then when she quit being offered money at that time a raise and the end of the article was like this doesn't have this doesn't have a good ending and it spoke to me especially today because I tweeted something important to me but it spoke to me today because what she spoke of was some incidences that I, I don't think I noticed that they were happening to me. I was so blinded because when I first started me working in media, it was just do what needs to be done, get the stories that the people need. I never, honestly, honestly, I didn't think that my being Ganyan or being black mattered. So I didn't pitch those stories. Can you imagine? And I think, yeah. Go ahead. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Please. No, no, please finish. Well, what's been coming up for me lately is, my God, what have I really been pushing down? What have I been pushing down? And that's why I'm, I'm scared to do things today, because I haven't been speaking up. Mm. I haven't been speaking up. So this is something I want to say about media. Maybe this is a great place to end, but I think that this applies to everything that we do. This reading club is a collective. It calls itself a collective, right? There's always more strength in numbers than there is us trying to do things or feeling like we have to step out to do things as individuals. And the way, you know, to go back to that earlier question about like, what does the future look like? If the future is starting to move in the direction that we want, it's going to be through collectives. It's going to be through small groups of people who take the time to commit to a set of values that they want to work together on through whatever they're doing, whether that be tech or business or journalism or civil service. Look at these grocery workers that just got ripped off by Galen Weston, who gave them $2 extra of coronavirus danger pay. And then before before the pandemic is even over is like, you know what, you don't need that $2 an hour extra, a billionaire telling them that they can't have this while a virus is still going around and killing people. People died today of coronavirus in Ontario and they took away the danger pay. How do you fight back against that as an individual? You can't. So an individual might feel really bad or guilty that they weren't like taking out this really courageous stand to like stand up against you know, these corporations and, and the way that they do wages. But the fact of the matter is that like, everybody has to do that. Everybody's responsibility is to, um, is to find a way to organize together, to find mm -hmm. a way to act together, rather than feeling like we're stepping out and taking this huge risk by yourself. I commend you for doing what you did today, even though it was scary. But it can't always be like that. It can't always be one individual. We have to protect and support one another so that our demands grow louder and louder as yeah. we build our collective. That's yeah. like what all of us yeah. have to do. Yeah, that is a great way to end it. Basically, we, we can only get better together. Isn't that a slogan somewhere? Anyway, um, thank you so much, <laughs> Desmond. Thank you so much to this collective. Uh, I'm so happy to have been to have been chosen to do this and Desmond it's really nice to talk to you thank you to everyone for the questions and the comments I really appreciate it and um, I can't wait to see what happens next and maybe a few of us will start a new independent paper I'm just saying 
I don't know. Who knows? Who, Who knows? I, I could. I think that that is a very possible future outcome. Hey, let's try it. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. I'm gonna go. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Desmond. I want to say thank you to the collective again. Thank you to everybody who helped fundraise the money. The Black Legal Action Center is one of the few kinds of legal resources of its kind for Black folks across the province. They're doing a lot of incredible work. Just as one example, we didn't have social distancing standards in our shelters here in Toronto, but people were still forced, of course, to stay there because they didn't have anywhere to go. The Black Legal Action Center was one of many organizations that sued the city of Toronto to force them to improve their shelter standards so that it was actually safe for people to stay in our shelters. This is the kind of work that they're doing. <laughs> so, so yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to the Bad Girl Collective. Thank you for making this possible. And thank you to everybody who supported the legal clinic. Thank you so much for that closing note. Everyone have a good evening and keep up your amazing work. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you so much.